driving is cool, but if you just drive forever without a destination, you're going to run out of gas. And so I think like a content strategy, we can use that same analogy because it's like a content strategy is really just a map of how you get from point A to point B with a business. What does it really mean to be a thought leader in B2B? That's what we're here to find out. This is The Notorious Thought Leader, a podcast for B2B marketers who want to generate demand by creating content that builds credibility and thought leadership. In each episode, Aaron Balsa helps demystify thought leadership and uncovers how companies are using thought leadership to generate demand. Let's get started. My guest today is Sonia Jacob. Head of Global Content Strategy at Meta. Thanks for being here, Sonia. Thank you for having me, Erin. So excited. Me too. I'm glad we're finally getting to do this. It's happening. It's happening. I know. We've been talking about this for a while. So, Sonia, you've had a really successful content marketing career, and you've worked at some really great companies like HubSpot, Kissmetrics, Dachshund, Drift, Cisco App Dynamics, and now Meta where you're focused on the business messaging solution. So even though it's meta, you're still squarely in the B2B space, right? Exactly. So before we go down the you know, rabbit hole of thought leadership, I'd love to ask you a question, which I'm sure you know, many listeners are wondering right now. So how can someone land a job at a top B2B SaaS company or like the companies that you've worked for? What do you think it takes to really stand out from the competition? Great question. I feel like at certain intervals, this question feels like more relevant than others. And I feel like it's super relevant right now, just as people are thinking through, like, how do I differentiate myself? How do I stand out in a super saturated market? So I think one of the consistent characteristics of my career, I feel like I'm, I'm advanced enough in my career, I can say this now, is, is just that it's really important to have a point of view. And I think one of the things that's been really instrumental for me is having a point of view on how to actually do content. And I think, you know, that means spending a little bit extra time sort of, you know, nerding out over the components of content, thinking more deeply about it. I think that that probably comes easily to a lot of writers who are, you know, coming up because they're, as writers, are used to sort of investigating things and understanding the, the underlying, like, factors at play. But I think that where you can really sort of accelerate your career is to pair that inquisitiveness with a real deep understanding of how businesses operate. And obviously for, you know, the B2B space is, is extremely relevant because it's not enough to just be good at words or, you know, to polish something. You know, I know we've talked about this before, but content marketing is so not a creative activity. It's a business activity. So I think one thing that's really helped me is just combining, you know, that love, that passion and perspective on how to do content with like a deep knowledge and understanding. And you know, continued curiosity about business and how it operates and how, you know, can be successful. God, I love that. So content marketing is not a creative activity. It's a business Ooh. activity that's totally going on a quote card. I love yes. that so much. <laughs> I also agree. You know, I think that people as early as possible should really start developing their content philosophy or their point of view, as you described it. And honestly, I'm so big into nerding out and really becoming passionate about learning you know, the history of marketing and how it's developed over time. And I remember one day I was watching, my daughter used to really like watching those makeup competition shows. Okay. And they were down to the final three candidates and they had to do a live makeup tutorial in front of a live audience. And they were talking while they were putting on the makeup. And then this one girl really stood out to me because she was such a nerd about the history of makeup and she could just read her passion. And it was right. so engaging. Yeah. And really that passion shines through in an interview for me. If someone really truly is passionate about, you know, yes, writing, of course, we want you to be a passionate writer, but that's kind of table stakes. I think most people that are applying for content roles are passionate about writing, but being passionate about marketing as a discipline, knowing some of the facts, you know, being that nerdy person can, I think, really help you stand out as well. Totally agree. And I think 
what's really interesting about the content marketing space overall right now is that like as it matures, as it sort of expands, you know, there's there's more and more people who maybe don't fit that criteria. And that's OK, because that allows more people to get into content, bring new and fresh perspectives to it. I think, you know, as I was coming up, you know, the predominant theme was like, oh, writers, you know, if they're interested in marketing, if they want to work in the tech space, they go into content. But now I'm seeing so many more diverse experiences before that, where you have people who, yeah, they, they're good at writing. They enjoy writing. They have like a facility with language and words, but they also have these other sort of X factors that I think come into play. And, you know, if we're, we're going to appreciate one thing about the broadening of the field, that's a really great component. When you say X factors, like, could you give an example of what you mean? Yeah, totally. I think that there are people who, you know, come into content nowadays with, yeah, maybe they came up as copywriters, but, you know, maybe they didn't. And so they come at it from, you know, customer marketing. And so they're coming into it and they're saying like, I'm super passionate about customer marketing, but I want to make a pivot into content because it's, it's you know, a hotter field. There's more competition for, you know, different opportunities there. And I think in those specific instances, people can actually make that transition a lot more easily nowadays, and then also capitalize on that and create different types of content. So video content, podcasts, things of that nature, I think we're expanding beyond just the written word and we're seeing the utility in, you know, like other media. Oh, interesting. So speaking about the written word and other media, that's a really good transition to kind of the quintessential question of this show, which is, in your own words, what the fuck is thought leadership? What the fuck is thought leadership? It's really, I feel like LinkedIn, someone on LinkedIn talks about this question every day. And I think there's like appetite for it, but the topic is so broad and complex that, you know, these conversations are necessary. But for me, the way that I think about thought leadership and have for a while is, Thought leadership is really, you know, a relevance play in the B2B context. You know, so you're using thought leadership, not for the hell of leading thoughts <laughs> or, or things like that, but to actually remain relevant in this increasingly competitive space with tons of voices. And, you know, let's be honest, like in the B2B, you know, sales and marketing cycle, it's not easy to get your product front and center 24 seven. Like people just like, they don't care. And you have to give them a reason to care. And thought leadership does that really, really effectively. But I think, you know, more broadly, thought leadership is about making a commitment to having a perspective, you know, and that is something that might start with, you know, your, your CMO or your CEO, but then it manifests in different ways throughout your organization. So Thought leadership, you know, is about having that differentiated opinion, but then being, you know, willing to share that across, you know, your marketing activities and your marketing channels on a regular basis. So I think, I think that's, you know, my, my take on thought leadership. Yeah, that's a really good point that has to be the regular basis. And that's a theme that's coming up again and again with different guests that come on the show. It can't be a one and done. Christopher Fox was on the show and he has a, a long career in thought leadership. And one thing he said that was really great, he said, you know, you can't just write a white paper, throw it over the fence once a year and baptize yourself a thought leader. It really has to be an ongoing effort. Yeah, I think the consistency thing is huge. And I also feel like that's why like a lot of people actually shouldn't commit to doing thought leadership because you need to be comfortable with the ambiguity of a long-term play. I mean, there are certainly components to thought leadership that can yield, you know, short-term results. Absolutely. But I think thought leadership in general as a tactic is an investment in your business that pays off way down the road and not as quickly as, as some folks would like. And I think that can quite frankly make a lot of B2B leaders uncomfortable. Yeah, everybody wants fast results, especially right now. Totally. And I think like the other thing is that you have a lot of sort of activities that are related to thought leadership that will help you get there. And those those ingredients are needed and can yield some, you know, short term gains. But in the long run, you need to have that sort of eye and that vision for something bigger and grander. When you say activities related to thought leadership, what were you thinking yeah. of? Totally. I think, you know, thought leadership as a category and as something that, you know, I view as a, like a relevance driver, there's lots of other sort of smaller time relevance drivers that, you know, as marketers, we leverage on a daily basis. I think about, you know, SEO activities and trying to understand what, you know, the market is searching for around your product 
to bring them to your site. You know, that's obviously become increasingly competitive over the years, but that's sort of like a, like a shorter term play on driving some of that relevance in the market. And then I think you can have like manifestations of that relevance in other ways. Like you have SEO, you have PR communications efforts. In addition to that, I think one thing that I see as a bit of a thought leadership play more and more, particularly post pandemic is the way events can kind of accelerate that thought leadership process. Hi, let's bring in all these people who are experts in a field that we're trying to position ourselves as experts and thought leaders in. Boom, it drives credibility and accelerates that process faster than I think a lot of more traditional content types actually do. So I think if folks are clear about thought leadership as being both that long-term play and then, you know, sort of constituted of all of these smaller efforts, I think that can be really effective. I'm glad you mentioned events. You know, events are such a great place to, yep. you know, share and hear thought leadership. And I think a lot of newer marketers, including myself, when we first started to think about thought leadership, it was all about writing and articles. And I think a lot of people still kind of think of that. Right. And that's definitely a wonderful format for thought leadership, but also getting up on a stage and speaking is an excellent format for thought leadership. You know, writing a book is an excellent format for thought leadership. Had Ashley Foss from Atlassian on, and she said, you know, the book is like the ultimate form of thought leadership. And Diogo Pineda said the same. So there's definitely so many different formats and they can be really complementary. Yep. Totally agree. And I think we'll see that more and more in terms of events being the strategic driver of thought leadership. There's nothing more effective if you're starting out with nothing in terms of thought leadership than bringing on experts in the space. And then, you know, in that way, you sort of hijack some of that clout to drive your relevance in the market. Hmm. And honestly, I think some people might be getting sick of just articles. We went through this phase where there was just such a focus on writing blog posts and writing articles and almost like to the point where you didn't want to see it anymore. It's like if your mom serves you like the same dinner every night for like 14 years, you just cringe. You're like, I cannot eat you know, this tuna noodle casserole, mom. Like, stop serving this. I'm sorry yeah. that. Yeah. And I feel like it's kind of happened. You know, the blogs, they're still a valuable tool, of course, for many companies and many businesses. But I really think that if you're still just blogging, maybe take time to reconsider if there might be a different format you might be adding in the future. I 100% agree. And I also think it's a really important topic right now because chat GPT is not going to be able to put on a thought leadership event for you with multiple people that's going to be like engaging and entertaining to like fellow human beings. So I think, you know, if nothing else, if I could put a positive spin on chat GPT and the future of content marketing, it would be, hey, like maybe this will free up some of your time to explore more impactful types of content in addition to, you know, just the written word. I mean, I think it's clear we've established that, you know, we need to have that in our sort of arsenal, but there's so much more out there. Yeah. I don't know why when you said chat GPT can't do events, I was just thinking of chat GPT like personified and I thought that his name was Chad. It was like, yeah, oh, Chad, oh Chad can't do events. Chad can't do events. No, no. offense to all the Chads out there. That's <laughs> different, but, you know, I think that it's definitely interesting. Like, I do firmly believe that we have to look at innovations like that as something that will help us become more progressive and more nuanced about content versus like necessarily writing our obituaries. Mm. So I think you know this. I work almost exclusively these days with sales-led companies that do enterprise sales. So they're selling into enterprise orgs. And a lot of times, you know, they're selling a really complex solution. So one of the questions I'd asked you prior to recording was, do you think that B2B companies that do enterprise sales should produce thought leadership? And you said yes. And I was wondering if you could just explain why you said yes. Yes, totally. I think it's critical for a variety of reasons. But you know, from a practical side, the enterprise sales process is a long one. It involves a lot of different stakeholders. You know, account types are complex. There's a lot of people who are weighing in on that enterprise software purchase. So I think that's where thought leadership can be extremely effective in converting the hearts and minds of those senior executives who are a part of a deal. You also have enough runway in terms of that typically lengthier sales cycle in the enterprise space to actually, you know, insert those thought leadership components. So traditionally, 
I mean, and certainly it's still a part of enterprise content marketing, at least, you know, from my experience these days. But traditionally, you know, you might go to an analyst firm and hope that they write about you in an upcoming analyst report. You know, you might hope that they feature you in the Gardner Magic Quadrant or something like that. But I think what I've seen, you know, pretty regularly in my enterprise experiences is that you need both. You need the Gartner to feature you, the Forrester to feature you, but then you also need to be driving really credible thought leadership content that speaks to the people who are in that, you know, deal room, so to speak. And so I think it can be extremely effective in that space just because, you know, the lead time is conducive to, you know, starting to produce that kind of content. But then I think in addition to that, there's just this tremendous appetite for influence in the enterprise space. And I just don't think that the Gartners and Foresters of the world are filling that up at the moment. So really, really critical to bring your own perspectives, you know, backed up by data and insights to really complement your whole sort of approach to thought leadership. Appetite for influence. Could you expand on that? I love that. I've never heard anyone say there's an appetite for influence. You know, I think People always want to tell you that when you're buying software, you are looking at a bunch of features and, you know, asking for ROI and, you know, trying to find out, okay, like, does it check all the boxes? And I think that that's probably accurate and perhaps more accurate in the SMB space versus enterprise, because I think what you have in the enterprise deal space is a lot of people who are a little bit more senior in their roles who are looking to understand the bigger picture about your, your product and your solution. And so I think that's where thought leadership can be extremely effective. If you can come in with really credible insights, original perspectives, and influence those decision makers, I think you have a really good shot of you know closing a deal with the help of thought leadership. I think that's super tactical, but that's where I see thought leadership really playing a role. I think the other component is that in the enterprise space, unlike, you know, content marketing in the SMB space, you know, you're talking about different avenues for the distribution of your content. You will have, you know, customer experience centers where CEOs from, you know, the companies that you're courting are coming to your company for advice on implementation of a specific piece of software or best practices. And that's where content that's, you know, predominantly thought leadership can be leveraged again. And so you can constantly repackage that And it really does impact the sales process in a meaningful way. And you don't need a lot of it, you know, like if you're doing something, a few credible pieces of content that can be leveraged and repackaged in a variety of different ways. I love that. I love hearing, you know, backed by data, because I think, as you know, I'm very passionate about conducting survey-based research. I'm also passionate about you know, taking a product data or taking data, you know, from maybe you've done some market research and you've accumulated this data, whatever it is, whether it's user data, survey-based data, it's really, you know, a great thought leadership play to package this in some sort of report. And when we're talking about sales enablement, like typically I hear a lot that sales reps love when we give them reports. They love when we break it down into little sections. So maybe it's just like a leave behind. Maybe it's just like a finding or two that pertains to a specific pain point or industry or, you know, use case or role. So I think in terms of the sales enablement piece, the data works really, really well in that way. And it doesn't just have to be the full 30 or 50 page report. It can be formatted in so many different ways. Yeah. And I I mean, I always tell people like, it probably shouldn't be the long form version of the report, you know, unless you have a very specific use case for it. But you know, you have to level up for the attention span of the, the audience, you know, and you can do that, like you said, by repackaging it in different ways, depending on the channel that it's being shared in. So I totally agree. It gives you original research of any variety, gives you so much mileage. And mm-hmm. you can do that, you know, by doing top of funnel market research that you field on a topic of your choosing, or you can leverage internal data if you are able to do that. Obviously, some limitations with some products, you know, regarding privacy don't permit that. No mm-hmm. problem. And you can still field your top of funnel market research and leverage it that way. And I think that goes back to what I said about thought leadership being a relevance driver. Like, create the conversation in the market, even when your product is not able to. And you can do that with thought leadership content. Yeah, for sure. So when did the concept of thought leadership first come on your radar? Oh, wow. I think... Honestly, I think it was starting to sort of, you know, crystallize when I was at HubSpot. 
So we're talking like the, you know, maybe 2013-ish, maybe slightly before that time frame. But I think, you know, it really picked up probably in the last five or six years. But I would say like it first came on my radar around the time I was at HubSpot, which was the 2013 time frame. And do you remember the first piece of content you ever worked on where the goal was really to build thought leadership? Yes, actually. And it was kind of unusual. So, and I'll say that looking back on it, I realize now it was thought leadership content. It wasn't at the time that I was actually realizing it was, but it totally was. And so Mm. one of the projects that I was involved in really early on in my content career was rebranding this. This this company was called Got Bmail, which is obviously a really rough name. And they rebranded as Grasshopper. And Mm. Specifically, what they were trying to do with their product was say like, hey, like this tool, you know, which is a virtual PBX, essentially, which is like a phone tree, but, you know, in the cloud. What we want you to be able to do with our product is run your business from anywhere in the world, but sound like a fully established company that, you know, someone would want to buy from. And, you know, they did this with the phone system. But, you know, if they were trying to rebrand themselves and then came to the market and said, hey, here's this cool phone system. You know, like it'll make you look more professional. It would be like pretty boring. So at the time, what we wanted to convey and what I was contracted to do for the company was actually create a what I think now is a thought leadership video. So I wrote a story about the power and you know the potential for transformation that small businesses can have. And really I was selling them on, you know, that transformative potential. And I think thought leadership does that in most cases. You know, it sort of presents that problem, you know, teases a little bit of the promised land and then shows you like really what you can do and how that future could be amazing for you. And so that was probably the earliest piece of thought leadership content that I ever did. And it was actually a video and it ended up going viral at the time, organically viral. This was like back in 2009. And I really do feel like it was a pretty foundational way to approach thought leadership where you're not necessarily talking about your product and why it's so great, but you're talking about this larger issue or problem or challenge in the market and the transformation that you want to bring about. And so I think that was like kind of my earliest form of thought leadership. That's awesome. Is the video still out there in the, the I, internet? Yeah, it's it's still out there and it's, it's cool incarnations. When Grasshopper was eventually purchased by a company called Citrix, And so, you know, that the original YouTube instance of it with all of the millions of views is, I don't think around anymore, but it's still out there. And, you know, I think that it speaks to how like sort of foundational and early stage the thought leadership movement was Mm. in like 2009, 2010 era. That's so cool. I'd love to see it. If you happen to find it, please share yeah, it with me. I will. It's going to be a blast from the past. So fun. Don't you love going down the rabbit hole and looking at it? I enjoy the- it. I enjoy oh it. Oh my God, it's so fun. So as you've grown in your career, yes. what's one lesson that you've learned about creating great content that drives business results? So maybe at the beginning, I know for myself, like when I started my very first, well, I didn't start as a writer. I started as an editor who also wrote. And it was just like understanding the whole point of like writing these things. I remember one of the earliest stories I pitched was like an interesting story, but I remember the executive editor, she was like, ah, but that doesn't really fit with our, you know, audience and our topics. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. So just like those early lessons that I think everyone Mm kind of goes through, if you could share a lesson that, that you remember being really meaningful. Oh, totally. I think, you know, one of the things that's always pretty consistent in terms of my writing is starting with the problem. People really, you know, you know, particularly in the software space, I'm sure this applies in other realms as well, but particularly in B2B software, yes, we're selling to businesses, but we're also selling to humans at those businesses. And so I think starting with the problem with your content is a really effective way for you, the content creator, to say to your audience, I hear you. I see you. I know what you're going through. And the more like unusual or interestingly you can do that, the more directly you can do that. I think the more of like an opportunity that you have to actually connect with people in a meaningful way. So I think that, you know, that's something that I've sort of led with throughout my career is like, if I'm getting stuck with something, go back to the problem. What is the problem that they're experiencing? How does it manifest for themselves in their daily lives? 
in terms of the target audience. Really dialing that in buys you so much credibility with the reader or the watcher. And I think that really pays dividends. So if you can constantly take your work back to, does this explicate the problem? Does it talk about the way that the problem manifests itself for the audience in like a credible way? Then I think you have like thought leadership, sort of like chef's kiss scenario. Love it. That's great. Do you like to inject like your own first person experiences sometimes in content, especially if it's something that does help the audience understand that, you know, you might have experienced the problem too and kind of like how you've worked through it? Do you ever do that? Totally. I think there are certain businesses, certain companies I've worked for where that was like more acceptable than others. It was really, really effective and totally acceptable at Drift to write in the first person. You know, it was something that head of marketing there, Dave Gerhardt did, kind of, you know, made a style out of it. And I think every writer sort of appreciates the ability to, you know, write that way because it's way more natural. And then, as I was saying before, it kind of allows you to connect with the reader much more quickly than you would otherwise. I realize that's not possible for every single B2B business, but I really do think it was incredibly effective for Drift, especially because they were, you know, new to the space, trying to make an impact. And I really think that that allowed them to do that, allowed me to do that with the content, just speak directly to the reader. And I don't think that that's anything that we came up with at Drift. You know, the David Ogilvy, great advertiser, basically to paraphrase poorly. But, you know, you really can't imagine that your ad copy is like you talking to a huge crowd of people. You have to imagine that you're having a one-to-one conversation. Mm -hmm. And so those one-to-one conversations feel Mm -hmm. way more authentic if you're using first person or you're actually saying like, hey, I understand the problems that you face on a daily basis. And here's, you know, how they manifest and here's how I can help you. Yeah, for sure. And even if your, you know, your brand doesn't allow for that kind of first person touch, you know, it's such a great use case for social media or for going on podcasts and exactly. helping to kind of evangelize your story and your messaging from a first person perspective. Totally, totally yeah. agree. So we have a lot of listeners who are marketing leaders and we have founders listening, people who need to hire writers and other creative talent. So we've talked about this before over coffee, and I'd love to kind of have you talk about this on air. Not every writer is a great fit for this specific type of work, right? There's so many different forms of writing. And, you know, when you're writing content for a B2B audience, especially, you know, maybe a technical, maybe a senior executive type of audience, it's not like you can just plop any writer off the street and have them get started. So if you are looking to hire a writer in this kind of workplace, what kind of person would you look for? What are the key attributes? Yep, totally. I mean, first off, I'll say hiring amazing B2B content people is probably one of the hardest things you can do as a marketer. I like to tell people that have no knowledge of marketing, (laughs) no understanding of B2B content strategy, the type of marketing that we do, the type of content marketing that we do is like 10% of all the marketers out there. You know, so you're not just sort of like writing things, you're trying to come at it from a place of knowing. And so I think one of the critical characteristics of almost all the content marketers I've hired is like a very genuine and deep curiosity. So like, for example, my background, like I didn't go to college for business or marketing. I went to college for sociology. And I got my graduate degree in sociology. It has nothing to do with that on the surface. But below the surface, I think what's really, really useful is that curiosity about groups of people, trends, phenomenology, and then a desire to unpack that. You know, How do you mm. pull together all of these different data inputs, data sources, and synthesize meaning from them? So I think all the great content marketers that I've hired have curiosity the desire and skill to research, but then also this inclination for trying to synthesize meaning from those sources. You know, I think the most successful ones are the folks that can synthesize meaning in a clever and unusual way. And I, I think that's really like the laundry list. The ideal candidate has those abilities. Then I think like tangentially related, there's just, a, you know, an interest in understanding business problems. Like how do we solve them with content? How do we use our content in a strategic way? 
to, you know, maximize like real business outcomes versus pursuing different content activities because we want to. That's that's the part of the field where it's like, no, this is not a creative activity. It's a business activity. And so I think those sort of characteristics are key if you're trying to hire a content marketer. I think there's like sort of a flip side to this where I think a lot of content marketing leaders have a tough time finding people who are, you know, like everything. Right. And I think like that, like it's worth calling out from my perspective because it's really hard for one person or a couple of people to do all those things well at a certain point in their career. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're making an investment in content and in thought leadership, you need to acknowledge that, you know, you have to right size that hire for where you're at in your business. So if you're early stage, you know, you're probably not going to, you know, hire a writer who is like, mid to senior level, super strategic, wants to spend a lot of time, you know, formulating her opinions, but you'll probably want to hire someone who's focused on output, taking direction from the thought leaders within the company who've already got this like articulated point of view. And that changes over time with the maturation of your company, of course, but I think it's just an important call out. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you got to give people a chance, especially if your budget is slim. You're not going to get some super sophisticated, strategic, experienced person with a lot of business acumen for, you know, $75,000. You're just not. So you got to understand. And if you don't have a big budget, like that's okay. Like I always look for soft skills. Like you said, that curiosity is really important. To me, drive, just someone who has an innate kind of drive to do excellent work and to get better incrementally better over time. Of course, someone who, you know, not just receives feedback well, but actually implements feedback, it can actually get better with feedback is really important. Yeah, that's actually like, I probably should have mentioned that. I think that that's, that's really critical as well. Like, it's tough because sometimes like really strong content marketers have a very, you know, a commensurately strong point of view on how you should do the content. But I think particularly at larger organizations where you're pulling together feedback from a lot of different people, it's important to realize that, you know, this content is created by you, but it's not necessarily an extension of you. And so Mm. the feedback that you're getting, you have to be able to accept that gracefully. And I'm not saying, you know, accept it and implement everything that, you know, stakeholders request, but think strategically about how you push back on certain types of feedback you'll, of course, get way more credit and, you know, sort of way more um, visibility if you're being selective about the things that you push back on versus, you know, constantly, you know, thinking that you're the authority and rejecting that kind of feedback. For sure. Like, you don't want to say yes to everything, probably, especially, you know, if you do have experience and you can, you know, take feedback with a grain of salt. So, for example, if somebody says, you know, this sentence, I don't really understand what you're saying, or this was confusing. That's feedback you want to listen to because you don't want to confuse your audience and this probably needs some reworking. On the other hand, if some feedback is like, hey, could we reduce the words in this sentence? Like, that's kind of arbitrary. Like, why? You know, it reads clearly. It's easy to understand. Do you just have this thing for short sentences? Like, I'm going to probably not necessarily take that one bit of feedback because it seems a little arbitrary. And I think it's also important for content leaders or marketing leaders who are giving feedback to content people to understand that it's really important when you're giving feedback to tell them explicitly, this is a suggestion, not a mandate, right? So otherwise, some like entry-level professionals are not going to know or have the confidence or even know that they're allowed to push back. And then they're going to spend all this time making these kind of arbitrary changes that aren't even necessary. So that's one thing that helped me a lot with managing creatives over the years, saying like, hey, you know, everything in here is just a suggestion, take it or leave it. Or, hey, these pieces here, these really do need to be addressed because A, B, and C. The rest of the things, that's just some suggestions. And I feel like that also really is empowering for employees because they don't feel like they're being forced to you know, rip apart everything. It's just like, here, here's some suggestions, but what you did is still really great work. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's, you know, you, you hit on like a really interesting part of content marketing that I think about a lot because, you know, how you incorporate feedback or how you don't incorporate feedback is really such an, like, it's super nuanced, right? I think that, you know, 
and this was popping up the other day, like I think on LinkedIn, as a content marketer, your sort of purview has really expanded these days. You know, you're working with more teams, more functions, getting feedback from more people who may or may not understand what it's like to make content. And so I think it's really important, you know, when you're working on a project to kind of right size the feedback based on, you know, the team that you're working with, try to understand like, okay, like how familiar are they with X, Y, or Z, you know, and then you can kind of compartmentalize the feedback in that way so it doesn't seem quite so maybe harsh or, you know, sort of, I don't know, however you might describe it. But I think that that whole like feedback loop can be tricky if you're working with teams you don't have a lot of exposure to on a regular basis. Yeah, for sure. So it's really important to give clear feedback, let people know whether or not they need to implement the feedback or if it's a suggestion. And there was another one that was top of mind for me, but I'm forgetting it now. Give clear feedback, let people know if it's a suggestion or a mandate. Oh, and just don't go feedback crazy. If yeah. you're not like actually the person's manager or editor trying to actively help them improve their writing ability, if you're a subject matter expert, you don't need to be giving advice on like, this sentence is too long. You just need to be focusing right. on the story, the messaging, you know, whether or not this is true or false, or we're representing the product in an accurate way. You don't need to be giving all that extra, like nice to have feedback. That just makes it much more stressful for the person actually trying to get this over the finish line. I totally agree. And I think that's a case where I think content marketers who are asking for feedback can be really, really specific about what kind of feedback they're looking for. So, you know, if you're bringing that SME in and you really only want them to review like the product components of the blog post, for example, you know, you can say like, hey, I would really appreciate your feedback where it would be super useful if you want to cut down on your review time is like zero in on this, this and this area. I would love your expertise there. I think that can kind of like focus some of the feedback and make it a much more sort of like positive experience for both parties. Great point. And it's so nice. Remember the first time someone did that for me? They were like, hey, at this stage, we're only looking for A, B, and C. We're not looking for deep developmental edits. And I'm like, man, this is awesome. And I took that as a learning and tried to start doing more of that in the future. That's a really great tip. So thanks for sharing that. 100%. So with the rise of AI and our friend, you know, Chad, GPT. Yeah. You know, Chad. Yeah. More and more people are saying how important it is to have skills that complement writing ability. So for example, editing or content strategy. So for anyone who might be interested in kind of getting into content strategy, I'm curious to know, how did you first get into content strategy? Where did you begin? Ah, yes. Where did I begin? So Oddly enough, I mean, I feel like this is odd, but you know, I think nowadays it's probably not so odd, but I... I've always been super, super interested in trends and, you know, group behavior. And so when I like went to college, I was like, cool, like I'm you know, going to study sociology, which is, you know, the study of like group trends and phenomenology. So I thought that I was just going to go teach that when I'd go to school, I'd go to graduate school for that. Turned out I didn't really want to spend my life in academia. And so oddly, um, around the time that I, you know, decided, okay, like, after grad school, like, this is it for me. I want to go do something else. Like, the something else that I had at my disposal was writing. And so it seemed like the natural progression to use that skill, you know, in the context of marketing, which is really where you see, you know, the, the study of trends, like, in stark relief, I would say. And so took that there, worked for, like, a nonprofit right out of grad school. You know, I remember at that time trying to, you know, convince their legal team that we should post on Facebook. So that was a real blast from the past. But yeah, I did that for a while and then sort of decided that at a relatively young age, I I wanted to do my own thing. And so I actually started the Cultivated Word, like re- pretty much right away after working at that nonprofit, I was already doing like freelance copywriting work. And at that time, sort of in the trajectory of everything, you know, technology and software was playing more and more of a part in just like people's consciousness. And so I started writing and freelancing for a lot of different, you know, small businesses, tech companies. And that community was incredibly helpful because they operate so much on referrals and word of mouth. So if I was a ghostwriter for one founder, that founder would, you know, send me to another one and it kind of built itself from there. And so that's kind of how I got my start in content. And I would say like the game changer was that video, you know, the 
It's called Entrepreneurs Can Change the World. And that really built my business, uh, The Cultivated Word. And that was really like the early days content, you know, world of content. And so from there, really sort of just jumped into the B2B space. You know, worked at HubSpot. That was like a like a crystallizing experience in terms of B2B content. So I think, you know, really bringing in all of those like research skills and also just like passion and curiosity for people, it was pretty helpful, you know, in really breaking into B2B content. And how about like content strategy specifically? If you're going to unpack that for a beginner, like what are the key components of a content strategy that someone would have to understand in order to build a strategy for their company or for their clients? Yeah. It's funny. I did like a speaking thing at a BU class where we talked about this and the like analogy that I gave, which I think is still pretty relevant is like driving is cool, but if you just drive forever without a destination, it's, you're going to run out of gas. And so I think like a content strategy, we can use that same analogy there because it's like a content strategy is really just a map of how you get from point A to point B with a business. And so you know, obviously A and B are always going to be different depending on the business that you work for. But in between, you know, those critical milestones, you're going to have certain steps that you need to take as a content marketer uh, to determine like what the right approach is. And I think a good content strategy is really telling you, okay, here's how I think we're going to get from point A to point B. Here's how we know we're going to be successful. And what I encourage people to do is to really, you know, narrow the focus. Like, That doesn't have to be, you know, your content strategy for all time. Really think about where the business is at and then just dial it right down. You know, you have to bring that content strategy to earth and make sure that you can like socialize that plan broadly with different stakeholders. And I think that in most cases is kind of the framework for content strategy that I've always used. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, it doesn't have to be the plan forever. It depends on your resources. If you end up having like a big, you know, infusion of cash, maybe you decide to invest in another channel or another asset type, right? You can completely keep that iterative and flexible as the business changes. Yep. Like I always come back to that, you know, driving and the map analogy because, you know, that's what we're putting together as content strategists. We're yeah. giving people, we're giving businesses a map for success. And I think, you know, that is like a helpful way to look at it. Yeah, for sure. I know a lot of people have, you know, the content strategy and some people will just have like a slide or two. Then they'll have a content roadmap that is more in detail for the people actually doing the work. One thing I like to do if I have an editorial calendar, I don't want to obviously share that with the CMO. They probably don't need to see every single title. What typically I like to do is give like a really high level roadmap, which will just show the campaigns over the time span. So, hey, what is the content team working on in Q2? You know, at a glance, you can see we have these four campaigns. And if you want to know more, there's the editorial calendar, the content strategy, the roadmap. And that can be really helpful. Yeah, Just letting people know the content team is working on strategic things and not just doing content just for the sake of doing content. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. I think one of the things that has been super effective, like, you know, in terms of content for the enterprise space, you're talking about typically more complex products. Like you need to assign your content people beats like you would like a reporter, like give them a facet of your solution or of your product and tell them to be experts in it, you know? Mm. And you know, it doesn't mean like it's gonna be that way forever, but for a period of time, you know, the first half of 2023, you tell them to run with a specific use case for your product from top to bottom of the funnel, what does that look like in terms of a content strategy journey? I think that's a good way to sort of make it manageable. Love that. So we're coming up on time. What final words of advice would you like to give to our listeners? Oh my God. So I think one of the most important things to do, whether you're a content marketer or hell, even if you're in product or you know what have you, is to fight the urge no matter what company you're at, no matter how successful it is, fight the urge to ever look inward. As a marketer, I think it's like super critical to get out of the building and to see what the market is doing and to stay connected to that. And I think, you know, like it seems obvious, but there's been so many scenarios I've seen firsthand in my career where 
you know, it's very easy to get wrapped up in how we do marketing or, you know, like the this way of doing it. And that's, it, it, you need that, obviously, that's part of your business. But it's really, really healthy for content marketers to always keep an eye on the market and what they're doing and what people are really asking for versus paying attention and almost like getting lost in in the product. And I think that's really helpful. It's been helpful for me throughout my career to constantly ask, okay, like this is how we're thinking about it, but is that valid? You know, do we have any signals externally that we can leverage to, to tell us whether our assumptions are right or wrong? And I think that that's really, really helpful as a content marketer, like constantly grounding yourself and like, is this just my idea? Or does like, or does the market actually feel this way? Because I think it's tempting sometimes, especially with really intelligent people, to think that the way that they're thinking about a problem is right. Oh, I'm an intelligent person. I've got this figured out. Well, no, usually you don't. So you have to take that to the market some way and figure it out or collect signals from the market that will help you do that. Yes, and is the way you're talking about the problem and the solution the way yes. that's landing well with your ICP? And I've seen that happen. You know, we had this one company is talking a lot about the specific term and it felt really good and it worked in other areas of the business. So we decided to keep using this specific term with a different audience. And after speaking to a lot of people in the ICP, we realized like this does not land at all. Just because this term helped grow the business to be successful, it doesn't mean that we can still talk about this in the same way with this brand new audience. So that's just really, really great advice. I'm glad that you shared that. So thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been really fun. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Erin. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Notorious Thought Leader. If you're looking for more stories from marketers who are generating demand from thought leadership, then visit us at motionagency.io slash notorious. See you next time.